tonight, a political pivot. Justin Trudeau talks gun control. We'll dig into the plan and the power of Canada's gun lobby. Liberals are for tougher gun laws. But as Trudeau tries to move the talk away from those images, we ask, what do they say about racism in Canada? A better world is possible. Millions march in climate protests around the world. It's just another uh, political hack job. A whistleblower sparks Washington's latest drama. And if we sat at home alone, the press crying, it's not going to get us there. A young boy's rare medical condition, his parents' urgent search for a cure. This is The National. For two days, Justin Trudeau sought forgiveness from voters as images surfaced showing the man who would become prime minister in brownface and blackface. Well, today, he and his campaign team were keen to talk about something else. But as David Cochran shows us, there was still more to learn about one of those pictures. Justin Trudeau wants to pivot his campaign away from apology and back to policy. His conversation changer is gun control. Thoughts and prayers are just not going to cut it. The choice could not be clearer. Liberals are for tougher gun laws. Conservatives are for weaker gun laws. Trudeau is proposing to ban assault rifles and give cities the power to restrict handguns. To punctuate this message, he strolled through Toronto's Danforth neighborhood, where a 2018 shooting rampage wounded 13 and killed two people including 18-year-old Liberal volunteer, Reese Fallon. Prime Minister, Hi. can I meet you? Of course. Hi. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Along the walk, the blackface controversy came up, but this woman offered forgiveness. Well, people held me accountable for what I did 20 years ago. It's your heart. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to you. I hurt a lot of the people and I'm kind of sorry about that. Well, I'm brown. Okay, I forgive you. Forgiven by one, not forgotten by others. Questioned by reporters, Trudeau disclosed new details about this video given to Global News by the Conservative campaign. It was a uh, costume day for river guides on uh, on the uh, on the on the whitewater rafting uh, uh, in the whitewater rafting operation that I uh, that I worked at in the summer of between '92 and '94, roughly. And once again, Trudeau could not say if there were more costume days in his past, more embarrassing photos or videos that could broadside his campaign. Trudeau is back in Ottawa tonight. He will take Saturday off before going back out on the trail on Sunday. The Liberals hope this weekend can provide a mini reset and allow their campaign to get back to the original plan. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, it seems the other federal party leaders are beginning to move on, too. The NDP's Jagmeet Singh and the Conservative's Andrew Scheer were back to talking policy on the campaign trail, but those images kept coming up. Our reporters are traveling with the leaders. I'm Hannah Thibodeau traveling with the NDP campaign. At an event where Jagmeet Singh re-announced his pharmacare plan, I asked him if Mr. Singh has had a phone call from Justin Trudeau in the wake of the black and brown face controversy. His office has reached out to my office. Trudeau wants to apologize, but Singh is a bit leery. And this afternoon he said he'd only take the call if it was private. I don't want the conversation that I have with Mr. Trudeau to be used as a tool in his exoneration or to be used as a way for him to say, I've had a conversation with a racialized leader and now I've done my job. Tonight, Singh said the NDP movement has been energized since the pictures surfaced because he feels more people are seeing themselves reflected in the party. I'm Katie Simpson on board a ferry bound for Digby, Nova Scotia. Andrew Shearer says he's not aware of his campaign having more compromising material on Justin Trudeau after it leaked a blackface video of the Liberal leader. Shearer argued Trudeau is a hypocrite for not living up to the standards he sets for others, though the Conservative leader dodged questions on whether he's also being a hypocrite for not apologizing for pointed comments from a 2005 speech against same-sex marriage when he is making candidates apologize for past offensive words. Scheer would rather be talking about his policy announcement today, promising $1.5 billion to buy new MRI and CT machines in an effort to reduce patient wait times. 
So that's a view of the campaign trail. But here's a closer look at what the Liberals are proposing on gun control and what their opponents say about it. Gun crime in Canada is on the rise. It's a fact. The main points, a ban on military-grade assault rifles, including the AR-15, a program to buy back those that were legally purchased. On handguns, the intention to work with provinces and territories to let individual municipalities impose further restrictions or ban them completely. And a pledge to not bring back the long gun registry. But conservative leader Andrew Scheer's take, broad bans won't work. And what we've heard is from police experts that it's more effective. It'll lead to safer communities if we use police resources to go after criminals and illegal firearms. The Conservatives say they would keep known gang members from being granted bail if arrested. And NDP leader Jagmeet Singh says handgun bans are just a first step. We need to make sure we invest in a brighter future for young people. We need to invest in affordable housing, make sure that there's good jobs for people. Now, of those three policy directions, only one would appeal to Canada's gun lobby. They've been marshalling forces in hopes of swaying this election. And Mark Kelly, a host of the Fifth Estate, gives us a peek at his investigation. It's one of the most revered and reviled rifles in the world. And now the AR-15 is in the crosshairs of Canada's polarized gun debate. This is not an assault weapon. This is a semi-automatic rifle, no different than a hundred others. And if this is gone, they'll come after the rest. That are effective in keeping Canadians safe. The Liberals have been telegraphing a so-called assault weapons ban for months. In response, one gun group tried to trigger a run on guns. If you don't have an AR-15, even if you do, and you've got room in your budget, go get another one. Buy one, buy two, buy three, buy whatever you can. You let them know that Bill Blair sent you. And this is the ubiquitous AR-15. There are currently some 66,000 legally purchased AR-15s in the hands of Canadians. They are restricted, meaning you can't use them for hunting, only at gun ranges. And the gun lobby, groups representing 2.2 million Canadians with firearms licenses, have spent the summer mobilizing their members with a clear message. Well, defeat the Liberals, yes, of course. Of course, and you know, the, bearing in mind that from our community's point of view, they desperately deserve to be defeated. Do you think that the, the gun lobby has the power to make or break a government in Canada? Yes, absolutely, without question. After the Ecole Polytechnique shooting in 1989, Heidi Rathjen brought petitions to Ottawa from half a million Canadians demanding a ban on so-called assault weapons. She says there's one reason it never happened. If we were in a democracy, we'd have a ban on assault weapons a long time ago. Mm -hmm. It's not happening. And uh, the only explanation is the strength of the gun lobby. The gun lobby is winning in the long run. It's getting worse. And we've got Mark Kelly here with more on the subject. And Mark, the most recent poll, I mean, you look at Angus Reid's finds, suggesting 75% of Canadians support a ban on assault weapons. And so how much power does the gun lobby really have at the ballot box? This is the political paradox. What appears to be a slam dunk isn't. Back in 1994, the Chrétien Liberals proposed an assault weapons ban along with the long gun registry. That was a political fiasco. The, the, the ban was scrapped, as was the long gun registry by the Harper Conservatives. A big win for the gun lobby. So now they were empowered. And they're also really intimidating the, uh, the Liberals now, the Trudeau Liberals. There's a big divide within the party. Should they or shouldn't they? Because this is not a vote getter in rural Canada bringing in a ban, but they've decided mm. to do it anyway. Still, the gun lobby is seizing upon this moment now, saying they have identified vulnerable liberal ridings where they're going to motivate the vote to get out there and vote against gun control. This is a vote getter for the gun lobby. So they have a message for the Trudeau Liberals. See you on Election Day. Mark, thanks very much. Thanks. And you can watch The Fifth Estate Sunday night at 9 on CBC Television. Mark will take us inside the gun lobby's fight to save assault weapons in Canada. Okay, an Ontario community held a vigil tonight to remember a young victim of gun violence. Jonathan Davis was killed last weekend in a horrific attack outside a Mississauga apartment complex. I want um, everyone to know Jonathan was a smart, lovable, kind individual who wanted to be someone in life. He wanted to be an electrician and his life was taken too soon. 
The 17-year-old was among dozens of families drawn to a parquette by an ice cream truck and the filming of a rap video. But everyone was sent scrambling when at least seven suspects armed with semi-automatic weapons showed up and started shooting. Five other people were injured in the attack, but no arrests to speak of just yet. Well, now to a story that played out around the world today. Millions of people in hundreds of cities walked off the job or out of their classes to demand urgent action on climate change. They took to the streets across Canada, too. But one of the largest marches was in New York. Stephen D'Souza is there. Climate change is not a lie. Do not let our planet die. They are young, angry, and they say the need for action is urgent. We don't have much time left. We have under 20, 30 to do something fundamental here. An estimated 250,000 people flooded Lower Manhattan today, among them Canadian Calvin Yang. I am genuinely scared that my future will be impacted by climate change and that like millions of us will be impacted by climate change. Many students here talk about fear. 15-year-old Mark Burt says his teacher recently asked their class how many students thought the world would be unlivable before they got to college. Most of our uh, peers raised their hands because all of this is that's happening in our world. Concern for the future is fueling worldwide protests from South Africa to Australia to the United Kingdom. In a moment, many hope is a global tipping point. The students here have three key demands. End dependence on fossil fuels, protect communities on the front lines of climate change, and punish the polluters. They took that message right to the heart of Wall Street today. All of this inspired by 16-year-old Swedish activist Greta Thunberg. In New York, she called on governments to act. They have a chance to prove that they, too, are united behind the science. They have a chance to take leadership, to prove they actually hear us. But students know the adults in charge, from the U.S. president on down, may not be taking them seriously. Still, they say, there's no time to waste. You can't change things later, you have to change things like now. If we want to have a future, we have to, we have to change now. it now. So, yeah. With the United Nations General Assembly next week and leaders coming from around the world, they hope their message is heard loud and clear. The people united will never be defeated. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Now, I mentioned thousands protested in Canadian cities too, including Toronto, Montreal and Vancouver. Green Party leader Elizabeth May took part in the heart of oil country. We did deliberately, as the Green Party of Canada, choose to be in Calgary for September 20th, the start of a global week of action. Hundreds of protesters turned out in Calgary, in Vancouver. Students demonstrated outside the city's art gallery. There was a big gathering in downtown Halifax as well, but also in smaller communities too, like Burlington, Ontario, a municipality that is committed to being carbon neutral by 2040. Okay, heading south. Donald Trump has already survived one investigation into whether he accepted foreign help to win an election. Now, Trump has another election coming. And tonight, there are new accusations of another deal with another foreign power for political advantage. And the extra ingredient in Ellen Morrow's story tonight, a mysterious whistleblower. Donald Trump today in the midst of a state visit and mounting questions. Did he try to strike an improper deal with a foreign leader? It's just another uh, political hack job. A whistleblower complaint to the intelligence community's watchdog reportedly accuses Trump of making an alarming promise. According to U.S. media outlets, it involves the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, and Joe Biden's son, Hunter. It's a partisan whistleblower. Uh, they shouldn't even have information. That dovetails with an existing Democratic investigation into Trump's July call with Zelensky and whether Trump pressed him to investigate Hunter Biden, who once worked in Ukraine in a quid pro quo for military assistance. How it was that Trump's was lawyer, in his convoluted way, admitted to pressing for an investigation. So you did ask Ukraine to look into Joe Biden? Of course I did. You just said you didn't. No, I didn't ask him to look into Joe Biden. I asked him to look into the allegations that related to my client which tangentially involved Joe Biden in a massive bribery scheme. Rudy. Wait, wait a second, wait a second. Wait. Joe Biden hit back this afternoon. So I have no comment except the president should start to uh, be president. 
The acting director of national intelligence sidestepping the normal process is refusing to share the whistleblower complaint with Congress. That's fueling accusations of a cover-up. Someone is trying to manipulate the system to keep information about an urgent matter from the Congress. But Trump said there's nothing to find. I've had conversations with many leaders that are always appropriate. But his critics say if he did push a foreign leader to investigate a rival's family, it's unethical, even impeachable. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. And Donald Trump again downplayed the possibility of war with Iran today, but he's sending more troops to the Middle East. The president has approved the deployment of U.S. forces, which will be defensive in nature and primarily focused on air and missile defense. The Pentagon says Saudi Arabia and the UAE requested the troops. It comes after an attack on a Saudi oil facility that both Washington and Riyadh blame on Iran. Okay, more news ahead on The National, including severe weather in Winnipeg, flooded streets, cars underwater, and there's more rain on the way. And later, our second look at the biggest story of the week, those photos, the fallout, and what it all says about Canada. And we have new details about Canada's first confirmed vaping illness, what health officials now say about the teenager who is hospitalized. See you in two minutes. Folks in southern Manitoba are accustomed to spring flooding, but it's much less common in September. Torrential rain pounded the region early this morning, flooding streets in Winnipeg and nearby communities. And as Karen Pauls tells us, more severe weather could be coming. It moved in quickly from the west. In Winnipeg, between 40 and 60 millimeters of rain fell in 90 minutes, overflowing storm sewers and flooding streets. There were dramatic videos all over social media, like these of a transit bus being inundated with water almost up to the seats. This house fire was blamed on a lightning strike. At one point, the city put out a statement saying people were trapped in flooded cars, later confirming emergency crews rescued six stranded people. My car just stopped right in the middle of that place. <laughs> then it wasn't just coming up with no lights or anything like that. Then the person next to me tried to maneuver and the same thing happened to him. The sky was falling in this underground concourse. They were also cleaning up nearby at the Fairmont Hotel. When the heavy rains came in, uh, unfortunately it appears the pressure caused for a drain pipe joint to come apart, uh, causing water to come through the ceiling. Then, just as suddenly as it came, the storm was over. By the afternoon, the flash floods receded, leaving stalled cars strewn over streets. Crews spent the day unplugging drainage sewers and cleaning up debris as Winnipeggers ventured outside to assess the damage. It poured buckets. Then there was lightning flashing all around. This went on for about half an hour. And then finally, there was one big bolt. And I, I think that's when the branch went. And it went boom. It's unusual to get storms like this in September, but the encore could be even worse. There's more rain, wind and hail expected tonight. And if that's not enough, there could be a third round tomorrow. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Let's get you to our national newsroom now in Vancouver. Ian is watching other stories from across Canada. And Andrew, we're going to start uh, with an update to a vaping-related story that we brought you earlier this week. The first reported Canadian case of lung damage that appears to be linked to vaping. Now, in the United States, many of these illnesses happened when people were vaping cannabis, but Canadian officials say that wasn't the case here. The high school student from London, Ontario, fell ill earlier this year. He was in intensive care and has since recovered. Officials now say the teen was vaping with a nicotine-based product. Workers knew it was coming, and today the General Motors plant in Oshawa, Ontario, officially shut down its car production line. More than 1,200 employees were temporarily laid off earlier this week. Today, that number grew to about 2,000 as work stopped on the line that makes Chevy Impalas and Cadillacs. 700 others at GM St. Catharines plant were also temporarily laid off. This follows a strike by almost 50,000 GM workers across the United States. That walkout has disrupted the company's supply chain throughout North America. 
And the RCMP director accused of endangering Canada's national security will wait at least another week before finding out when he'll have a bail hearing. Cameron Ortis appeared in an Ottawa court this morning through video link. The 47-year-old was the director general of the RCMP's National Intelligence Coordination Centre. He's accused of preparing to share sensitive information with a foreign entity or terrorist organization. His lawyer says he has a synopsis of the case against Ortis but needs more information in order to move forward. He'll be back in court September 27. Some frightening moments in a Chicago mall earlier today when a man rammed his SUV through the entrance and drove inside. We'll have the video and the story in about 20 minutes. Okay, and time for a quick break. Up next, our second look. We dig into those images of Justin Trudeau in blackface and explore what it says about racism here in Canada. And later, a couple fights to save their son's life and pay for the multi-million dollar treatment he desperately needs. Welcome back. It's been a heck of a few days, hasn't it? Who could have predicted this? Time magazine unearthing a photo of Justin Trudeau dressed as Aladdin in brown face for an Arabian Nights themed fundraiser back in 2001. His apology came very quickly. Darkening your face, uh, regardless of the context or the circumstances, is always unacceptable because of the racist history of blackface. I should have understood that then, uh, and I never should have done it. Now, since that photo and others were circulated widely on Wednesday, it has forced Canadians to put themselves into very different camps. There are those who think this whole episode has been dramatically overblown, that you can't judge a person's past through the lens of the present. Others say it's precisely that attitude that ignores the very, very real, very cumulative effect of the photo that we just saw and other moments like it. Then there are those who think maybe in arguing about all of this, we're actually missing a broader point. Now, every Friday, we take one topic in the news and we try to break it wide open in a way that's interesting, insightful, and empowering. We call it our second look. And tonight, we want to take a good, hard look at what those Trudeau photos tell us about ourselves and about this country. As we always do, we have help from a diversity of perspectives. In studio, we have Donovan Bennett, host and writer at Sportsnet, Elamine Abdelmahmoud, editor at BuzzFeed, co-host of the podcast Party Lines with our own Rosemary Barton, which is an excellent listen, by the way. Uh, and from Montreal, we have Emilie Nicolas, columnist with Le Devoir. So here, hello. So, so here we are, two days later after seeing the first photo surface, almost two decades after it was taken. Donovan, start us off. I mean, has your thinking of the photos, now that we've had a few days to, to process them, has your thinking of them changed over the last couple of days? It has, and it still has me in a place of being conflicted. And here's why, because immediately I was upset. It, to me, it reeked of privilege. You have the privilege to be unaware of how you're impacting others. You have the privilege of having people forgive you for it. That's not a privilege that I'm afforded, right? If I did that in my role at my job, I would lose my job. And my job is not nearly as important as his. But then I made a call to my grandparents, who were really my moral compass. Mm. And I thought they would actually be more upset because they in their lives have seen real, real racism to their face. And in fact, they were in a space where they were willing to forgive. But, and, but what is it in their perspective that you think is, is so reasoned? I mean, why is it that they fundamentally look at it differently? Because they see racism every day. Because they can't afford to be upset with every little macro or microaggression. Because if they were, they wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. Elamine, I want you to jump in because, you know, we, we've seen so many people who are outraged at what happened. Some people are outraged on other people's behalves right. as well. I mean, what's your sense? I mean, is it like Donovan says, I mean, in, in a way, there's a risk of, of missing the, the forest for the trees here. Right. So uh, outrage seems to come from a place of surprise usually. So it really depends on how surprised you are about this whole episode. You might be shocked that the picture surfaced. Are you really surprised that this kind of thing happened? Um, and I think if you talk to a lot of racialized Canadians, I don't know if they'd be that surprised that um, someone who grew up in an environment of a lot of privilege, someone who grew up moving in the circles of private schools, um, who, 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 who circulated in those universes, um, might think that it's okay 
to participate in blackface because frankly, like I went to one of those schools and like lots of white people felt uh, the, like the, the uh, hmm, let's say permission uh, to, to, to wear other people's cultures as costumes. So to me, like him as an individual, it's not especially surprising that he would do this. But then when you start to zoom out to the macro and you imagine those images that we're beaming today into, into living rooms that have children um, that, that, that look like us, um, that, that, uh, that see these images and find them painful and hurtful and they're so confused about what's happening, um, I think there's no way to divorce the two. Right? So it's like, this is surprising. Um, this is shocking for those children who have not been used to seeing something like this. Amy Lee, what, what is your sense of, of the bigger picture here? And, and I ask you that, I mean, particularly as someone in Quebec. I mean, Trudeau has his roots in Quebec, where, where, where at least one of these incidents took place. Well, so the outrage, it's interesting, um, in Quebec is not as strong, and part of it is... Um, there's been a whole history just in the last decade of blackface being put even on shows uh, on Radio Canada, so on the French on the French network of the CBC. Uh, it's been in our in our theaters as well. Uh, there's there, there's there's a whole lot of labor that still goes uh, regularly in organizing protests, doing education as as of why blackface is wrong and why it's also part of our history in Canada and in and in Quebec. And so I think. In terms of what's happened for me, the broader picture is one, uh, we don't acknowledge that black, anti-black racism is a part of Canadian history. And Justin Trudeau is very much part in this, of that problem. Every time he repeats that racism is not a Canadian thing, right? So when we, when we say things like that, uh, we encourage this perception that everything that's bad that ever happened only happened in the United States. So we have a public that's broadly in, uneducated or miseducated about, about how to talk about the importance of, of, uh, of issues such as blackface. And that's for one. And the second thing that's very... I guess for me disappointing in terms of how this conversation is unfolding is that we are still having this conversation about whether Trudeau is a good or a bad person rather than regarding you know looking at the gesture and then the results of that gesture uh, and 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 we're still focusing the outrage on things that are very much overt blunt racism and I really wish we were at a point in, in 2019 where we, where we had that same outrage and interest for actual policies and actual systemic racism that impacts the lives of thousands of black and racialized Canadians every day. Well, and, and so you raised so many good points there and, and, and key to all of that, I mean, it seems to me that the way we react to this story, right, is, is so important. And, and so let me just play a clip here. This, is, this was American late night TV's uh, take on this story. I'm not going to show you the picture because it's really bad. It's so bad that Canadians traveling in Europe are going to start telling people they're American. This is pretty bad. And I just want to say, it's not us this time. Suck it, Canada. So here's why I want to play this clip. And this is kind of what I struggle with, right? In, in our rush to react, sometimes with ridicule, sometimes with humor, sometimes with condemnation, sometimes with shame, it, it, it feels like maybe we're, we're missing something else that, that underpins all of that. Mm. And so it's it, it just in, in this rush to, to demand apologies, to demand contrition, to demand remorse, I just wonder, are, are we, uh, is everyone arriving at the same understanding of exactly what's being apologized for? Do, do you think that people understand um, exactly why something like this can be perceived as being as, as hurtful and as damaging? Uh, certainly not. Uh, we're not having an evolved conversation about race in this country. For, we, we never have, um, but this was a moment where we could have began that, but we are not having that because the questions that, are, that I think are being put to Justin Trudeau um, are not questions that will actually get those results going. Um, so when he's asked, why did you do this? Um, and he says, I made a mistake, that's not a good enough answer. And the reason it's not a good enough answer is because there's a whole context uh, to why he felt enabled to do something like this, a whole context of racism, a whole context, context of white supremacy um, that just seeps into our everyday language and everyday society um, that a lot of people are blind to. And, and, and um, so, so, but, but yeah. let me ask you, I mean, if, if, for the sake of helping people understand mm -hmm. this issue, yeah. I mean, how best would you articulate the hurt, right? For, for someone who, who understands academically, yeah, sure. I, I know this is wrong. Yeah. I get that we shouldn't do it. Maybe I even have a historical understanding of why I shouldn't do it. Right. 
but why does it hurt as badly as it does? To me, this is all about, to your point, who was asking the questions, yeah. the fact that there aren't people that were black and brown in those spaces, again, is the bigger issue. And he, if we learn anything from this, is symbolic. Because I don't think this is just about the prime minister. Mm -hmm. We had a nostalgia around him that he represents us as a country, young, good-looking, woke, feminist, yeah. cares about the climate, cares about racial issues. And we as Canadians say that we're diverse and say that we're all those things because we're right next to the United States. Yeah. And we're better on many of those issues than they are, which is not necessarily a high bar to clear. But if we're really having the conversation, we're not great in a lot of those issues. Yeah. The lived experience for minorities in this country is not always good. But the people having the conversation and saying that we are are elites who don't feel that pain every day. Yeah. Uh, Amy Lee, I want to bring you back into the conversation here because, you know, I, I look at the news cycle. It, it, it already seems primed to move on from this. And, and I, I don't have a doubt in my mind that there are people out there who feel the same way, that, look, we realize this was bad. That was a long time ago. Aren't there more important things to talk about? I mean, can you just, just speak from the heart and, and help us understand what exactly all of this has meant to you? Well, if... Um... I think in terms of speaking from the heart, there is a good precedent already in uh, the response that Jagmeet Singh had to the issue when he decided to first address uh, people who have lived experience of racism, especially in school, because Justin Trudeau was a teacher at the time. And so the issue is, is also, you know, what if you're a racialized uh, kid and you see your teacher do something like that and what, what's the impact it has on you? Uh, I think uh, most people who are racialized who've been in the school system in Canada do have uh, experiences uh, and memories of incidents where they were taunted or mocked for their feature. Um, and when you only see yourself uh, and your feature uh, in uh, represented in a way that's basically for to, to, to make a clown of yourself, you start you start thinking that that you're ug ugly, or you start thinking that uh, your your own natural fe features are sort some sort of a joke. So this kind of internalized racism is a is a reality uh, for kids. It's a reality for kids who grew up uh, in uh, areas that are outside of the c communities of color of color specifically. And so those those are those are realities that are very real. The issue of race and power and privilege is not just a minority issue. Mm -hmm. It is an issue that white people often have that minorities are left to deal with. Right. And so the conversation can't just be minorities talking about it or, in a way, minorities explaining racism to white people. It's almost like you're asking someone who's abused, their therapy is to help rehab the abuser. The conversation needs to happen amongst white people, recognizing your privilege, acknowledging it, right. reconciling with it. To the three of you, a fascinating, useful conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for making the time because certainly there may be another opportunity in which this very same thing comes up again, maybe with a different person, maybe on a different issue, but I suspect this conversation is far from over. Elamine Donovan, Amy Lee in Montreal, thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. All right, and we are back in two minutes with an update on a family's fight to save their little boy and get him the experimental treatment he desperately needs. An update now on a story we first told you about in July, about Michael Privilakis, a toddler running out of time. His parents have been racing to raise enough money for an experimental cure for his rare genetic disease. They're making real headway, and as Joanna Romiliotis tells us, they're taking that effort to the next level. I'm going to go anywhere. At the very beginning of this journey, I told the doctors I'm going to do anything, go anywhere, and give up everything if I have to. And uh, this is part of that journey. It's always been about one thing, curing his son. On this day, Terry Peruvalakis is on his way to San Diego to a global conference on rare genetic disorders. He wants to talk to every expert he can find, and he's taking his plea with him. The sign is basically to help spread awareness to our cause. If we sat at home alone, depressed, crying, it's not going to get us there. These are the type of things that we have to do. Go. Uh-oh. Slow, slow. Say hi, Chan. Hello, would you like a hand? Yes. Hi. The race against time is cruel and unrelenting. Michael Perovalakis is the only child in Canada diagnosed with SPG50, 
Come on. Mm, great work. A rare genetic disorder that threatens to paralyze him. Done. Hands over here. Ah. Woo, woo. Good try, good try. Therapy yeah. now is about halting his decline until his parents can find a cure. Good job. Anything that facilitates active movement is what we want. Michael's story captured headlines and hearts after he was diagnosed in April. His disease is so rare, there is no existing treatment. But there is hope at a staggering price, custom gene therapy that costs $3 million. What is a reasonable amount to expect? Is there anything to expect? Terry came to the conference in San Diego to learn how to apply for funds and grants. So much about gene therapy is new. So much depends on desperate parents forging the way. At stake is my son, right? My son uh, becoming paralyzed is what's at stake. Uh, him uh, having a brain degradation is what Michael has coming to him. So everything's at stake for us. Every minute matters. Michael's family has drained their savings and so many people have rallied to help. In their neighborhood especially, a sea of support. And the plan is to send posters to every corner of the world. Back home, the kindness of strangers has already been overwhelming, says Georgia Perovolakis. You know what the cutest is the little kids. There have been so many lemonade stands for Michael that it was just so heartwarming to see how they just saw his story and they just jumped on it. Um, to see like little kids helping little kids is just amazing. Hold on, hold on. The money raised so far, nearly $700,000, is funding the first phases of a clinical trial in Dallas. Researchers here have created a virus that could transport a missing gene to Michael's brain. It could cure him, but there is more testing to be done and more money needed to do it. You're gonna walk to the bunny. There we go. Come on. Let's Got go. it? Let's go. Imagining a cure okay. is fuel to keep going. <laughs> you crazy kid. I envision that day, yeah. And then that moment afterward where he does the hard work to gain the stuff that he's lost. Absolutely. Can you see it, Georgia? You know what, I have days where I can't see it because I'm with him all the time and I see him struggle and I see him trying so hard. And sometimes it's hard for me to envision that moment. It seems, you know, Terry's more positive than me. Um, but three million is a long way away. Go slow. But they say they'll get there. Hold on, oh, two hold hands. On. Even go. if it's one faltering oh, step at a time. Joanna Brumoliotis, CBC to News, Toronto. Yeah. You want to touch him? <laughs> More news ahead on The National. Ian is back in two minutes. Plus, Sunday's Emmy Awards could bring top honors for a growing genre of television. True stories of injustice that are forcing authorities to take action. Welcome back to our national newsroom in Vancouver. Some stunning video coming out of Chicago showing the moment a man drove his SUV through a shopping mall. Stop Yo, this is not happening right now. What the? Just, just imagine what it was like to be inside while all of this was going on. Officials say three people were taken to hospital with injuries that are not life-threatening. The 22-year-old driver now in custody, and police said this evening they didn't know yet what the motive was. In Texas, Tropical Storm Imelda may have moved on, but now residents are assessing the damage. It's starting over. With what? Because we don't have anything. Overwhelmed, in state of shock. At least four people died during the storm and rescues are still underway for people trapped by the high water. To give you a sense of how much rain fell, in just a few days, parts of metropolitan Houston had close to what Vancouver gets in an average year. Sections of the interstate remain closed with no word on when it will reopen and a major bridge will need to be inspected after it was struck by a barge that came loose. And in her first television interview, an accuser of Jeffrey Epstein is alleged Prince Andrew was also an abuser and took part in Epstein's exploitation of her as a teenager. 
Virginia Jufri claims Epstein directed her to have sex with a number of powerful men, including Prince Andrew. She has previously said she was abused in the bathroom of a London house in which she was pictured with the prince. Justice now is holding accountable the perpetrators that helped him and participated with him and encouraging more people to come forward. Prince Andrew denies having any form of sexual contact or relationship with Jufri. Hollywood is getting ready for the Emmys this weekend. Next, a look at how stories of true crime and injustice could be big winners. The National is back in two minutes. Well, even in an era of dragons, sagas, and political satire, a growing genre of television could be in for a major haul at Sunday's Emmy Awards. Documentaries and historical dramas about injustice and abuse. As Uleka Nathu explains, they are programs so powerful, they're forcing authorities to take action. I do see myself as a victim of R. Kelly. Hundreds of court and police documents, dozens of interviews. The Emmy-nominated Surviving R. Kelly is one of several recent projects that did the detective work normally reserved for police. I also had to keep in mind the responsibilities that one has in a documentary to make sure that I am producing a transcript that could be subpoenaed in court. Shortly after Surviving R. Kelly aired earlier this year, officers charged the singer with multiple counts of sexual abuse. And it's not the only TV series cashing in on investigating true crime. Conditional examination evidence. Real estate heir Robert Durst will go on trial early next year for murder. This was found inside this. How is he going to back out of that? His arrest was due in large part to the 2015 HBO docuseries, The Jinx. Everyone is talking about making a murderer in the trials of Stephen Avery. From The Jinx to Netflix's hugely popular Making a Murderer, many small screen miniseries are drawing attention to social injustices that might otherwise go unnoticed and it's galvanizing viewers to push for change. They saw you rape the lady. I didn't see a lady or hit anyone. The four-part historical drama When They See Us on Netflix has been nominated for 16 Emmys. It unpacks the infamous Central Park jogger case, five boys of color wrongfully imprisoned for rape and assault in New York. Shortly after it aired, the woman who prosecuted the teens more than 30 years ago faced tremendous public backlash. Linda Fairstein was forced to resign from several boards. Her book publisher dropped her. This crime writer says viewers are outraged. You're seeing uh, justice being miscarried in some cases and you want to see it resolved. You have had sex with female trainees of yours, correct? Is that true, Mr. Chowdhury? No. Now, an upcoming film about this man might follow in those footsteps. Bikram, Yogi Guru Predator, premiered at this year's Toronto International Film Festival. The documentary traces the rise of the man who brought hot yoga to Beverly Hills and beyond. He's been accused of sexual harassment and assault. I hope it encouraged more people to, to speak out. Director Eva Orner wants to see criminal charges laid and studios like this one to separate themselves from the Bikram name. If viewers mobilize, it could force officials to take a harder look. Zule Kanethu, CBC News, Los Angeles. Okay, well, you've heard about a job being so boring it's like watching paint dry. Well, meet the guy whose job it is to watch concrete dry. Next. If you think your day job is boring, you might want to meet Jake Taylor. Part of his job this week was to literally watch concrete dry. It turns out distracted pedestrians tend to walk through wet concrete, and Jake is there to help people avoid some potentially sticky situations. His day job is our moment. I'm uh, watching the concrete here dry because uh, barriers don't seem to be enough to keep people off of them these days. And, you know, it's a busy part of the sidewalk and stuff that I knew that someone was going to need to be here permanently the whole time it was drying. I'm expecting a lot of people to kind of scratch their heads at first. They think that we're, you know, just kind of sitting here being, you know, lazy or something like that. And it's not. People don't realize uh, how much they can set us back with just like a simple footprint. I've had to stop someone who didn't even notice. They, they stepped on the very edge and they put a, you know, a nice dent in the edge there. And they just, they kept walking like they didn't even realize anything happened. I just kind of catched up to them and said like, Do you, did you notice that, you know, the ground was a little soft there when you took a step? 
<laughs> just sit and watch traffic and kind of keep my eyes open for anyone on the sidewalk. Um, I'm not sure about anyone else. <laughs> Almost seems like at this hour is 22 minutes skip, but it is real. It is part of the national. And Andrew, I do have to ask you here on the national, on television, have you ever been tempted, even for a split second, to step into fresh concrete? No. <laughs> why, why, why have you? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, and as I walk around uh, and I, you know, slave to my Fitbit, walk around a lot, I, I see people who have done that and I wonder what their story is. Maybe it was just an accident, but <laughs> they know they'll be remembered almost forever. It, it, okay. It, it just doesn't seem like a helpful thing to do. Anyways, uh, that's, that's cool. That's the national for this September 20th. Have a good night, folks. Good night.